Right, well, the, the, the full house uh, this morning, uh, immediately after a bank holiday, uh, is a sign of the great interest uh, there is in, in what Tom, Tom Tugendhat is uh, about to say. Uh, uh, his talk is entitled Defending the Rules, and uh, a number of us here I know have, uh, have known Tom for some time, uh, from his time working uh, for the Chief of Defence Staff, uh, and indeed uh, for seeing both government uh, security policy uh, uh, in a number of guises in the Ministry of Defence and the Foreign Office, but also importantly seeing security policy at the front line in Iraq and indeed in, in Helmand. Uh, and it's not often, and, and of course an academic background uh, studying theology and Islamics, was that the title Tom, Islamics? Um, and lived and worked in Yemen in Beirut. And in our political system, it's not often you have an individual so qualified by experience and education uh, in a particular area uh, who enters politics as uh, he did in 2015, being elected for the first time and as a member of parliament. And it's even more rare when somebody with that life experience in a particular area enters politics and then actually takes a role related uh, to that life experience <laughs> uh, and doesn't become uh, the junior minister for screwdrivers or whatever it might be, some totally unrelated but very important area. Uh, Tom, rather, has uh, last year took on the really very important role of chair of our Foreign Affairs Committee in the House of Commons. And as many people here know, the role of those select committees becoming ever more important in raising the standard of our public debate, not least in relation to foreign policy. And under Tom's chair, the committee has already uh, produced a number of interesting and, and thought-provoking reports, most recently, Moscow's Gold, uh, select committees in the House of Commons seem to have at last cottoned on to what think tanks knew all along, that it's useful to have headline grabbing titles on their reports. So I don't know, maybe that I, I'll take that as a compliment to uh, think tanks. Uh, according to the Times this morning, uh, Tom uh, will call for Boris Johnson to be given uh, more powers, uh, despite apparently Tom being one of uh, uh, Mr Johnson's uh, critics. We shall see shortly whether or not <laughs> uh, Tom's speech can be interpreted in that way. What I do know is that we as a country desperately need a vigorous debate about our foreign policy more than ever in a world which continues to change rapidly, but also a world in which uh, after our exit from the European Union, uh, there will be changes. Uh, this is an important event. Things will not go on exactly as they are, and uh, moving into unknown territory, it's more important than ever we have uh, political leaders who are able to think sensibly and think the unthinkable in some cases. Tom's remarks are going to be uh, on the record, uh, and his Q&A are also going to be on the record and filmed by Rusi TV as well as by uh, Sky TV. Uh, so it will be on our website uh, subsequently if you miss any of the remarks during uh, the question, uh, the, the Q&A. So uh, Tom, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. I take uh, the turnout both an indication that we're on recess and an indication of the great interest that our country has in foreign policy. So I'm going to start today, if I may, by offering a vision of what I think our foreign policy should be. It's one that calls upon us to remember who we are, what we can offer, and how we can deliver it. And that's why I'm focusing on the nation state, on the rule of law, and, of course, on the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Now, like all truly conservative speeches, this one isn't new. This is just an exercise in remembering what works and trying to apply it for today. Admittedly, that's not originally what I'd planned to speak about. I was going to talk about the threats to the rule-based international order, about the shared commitment to abide by agreed rules and norms, most of which, of course, were set down in the years following 1945 that we, 
the United Kingdom was so key to writing. That is, after all, the topic that's getting a lot of attention at the moment, because the existing order is very much under threat. From Russia undermining the United Nations and flouting international law, to China's growing assertiveness in international affairs, and of course questions arising from the growth of important powers like India. But the most important challenge isn't these, it's our own. It's our own disillusionment. The West, that group of nations stretching from San Francisco in the West to Seoul in the East, who value the rule of law, economic liberty and human rights, seem to be losing interest in the rules-based international order that has done so much to keep us safe since the end of the Second World War. The rules that, as unfashionable as they are, have stood between us and the demons of our worst nature. There are many reasons we could suggest for this disillusionment, but most seem to be the symptom, not the cause. I would suggest at root there is perhaps something more human going on, a collective amnesia. The terror and unrest of previous eras has drifted far from people's minds, and the events that shaped the lives of past generations have become distant memories. Today, too few have looked the devil in the face. Too few have seen what can happen when the rules collapse and anarchy reigns. Too many see peace as the ordinary state of affairs, when a cursory glance at history makes clear that peace is painstakingly constructed and easily lost. Peace is, of course, the exception, not the rule. But that's a speech I've given many times before, and I'm sure you've all heard it many times before, and we're all bored of it now. In fact, I've given it so often, I'm bored of it too. So I'm going to talk instead about what we should do about it. We have a diagnosis. Now we need to find a cure. Now, for some, the cure is obvious. Since becoming chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, I have met many experts. Their views vary, but in essence, their focus is the same. We must stay close to Europe, they say. We must work more with the UN, with NATO, the OSCE, and others, they argue. We must recognize that our strength is in leveraging others. We don't stand alone. In other words, they say, rebuild the old equilibrium. Now, I understand where they're coming from. I even agree with much of their diagnosis, but it's not enough. It ignores the tremors of the past decade. It pretends that Putin, Trump, Brexit, China, India, and many other changes are just passing events. It forgets the only truth in life. You can't go back. That's why I'm not looking to build on the, sorry, that's why I'm looking to build on the past and not copy it. That's hardly surprising for a conservative, but I'm also a British internationalist. I'm convinced we must find new ways of working with our allies. I'm looking to bring together ideas for a new conservative internationalism, if you will. This isn't just because Brexit changed our foreign policy, but it did. It isn't just because the global order is being reshaped by others, but it is. It's because for too long, we've stopped asking, what do we need? What does our country want? And most importantly, how do our people see their place in this world? Instead, too often we've hidden behind treaties and organizations. And it's worth remembering, that's not how we started. Those who drafted the European Convention on Human Rights and the United Nations Charter were not frightened of our laws and our politics. They weren't choosing to put foreign authorities above our own. They were projecting power. They knew what we seem to have forgotten, that, laws, that the laws that built Britain, the rules that recognize human dignity, economic liberty, and political empowerment shape our world towards justice and freedom. Now that doesn't make them perfect, but judges constrained by parliament and independent, not just from government, but from the groupthink of collective maneuvering sets them apart and they too have helped shape our nation. They help write the rules that are an element of what our foreign policy should be, an expression of our national identity 
projected into the world. That is where foreign policy must start, at home, because a foreign policy that works for the British people is one that builds on their values and promotes their interests. It starts with the basic unity of legitimate authority, the state. Now, forgetting that that is where our trouble has started. While other countries have struggled to work together, we've too often forgotten what it means to be a nation alone. That matters today because the rules set down in 1945 and in the years following it were never going to last forever. But many of the experts who came to see me, who come to see me, are yet to, to come to terms with that fact, that multilateralism itself is coming apart at the seams. It's worth asking why it's failing. And there are many causes, but two that really affect us. Firstly, in Europe, the EU's centralizing supranational instinct is out of kilter with the temper of our times. As a prime minister of one of the founding member states said to me only the other day, it's a real shame that the European Commission I'm so sorry. It's a real shame about the European Commission. If we'd just been a group of nation states in Europe, we could have made this work. Secondly, looking further afield, the United Nations is struggling to keep up with a changing international order. The credibility of the Security Council is draining away, as the veto has lost much of its moral authority. How can it keep it when it's used to shield brutal dictators? How can international law be defended when all that is needed to violate it is a member of the Security Council ready to veto criticism. So we find ourselves today in a situation where two key institutions are failing to protect the very system they were created to uphold. I believe that we are leaving, therefore, through a sea change, not a passing storm. We would face many of these challenges regardless of Brexit, but when we leave the European Union, the change will be greater than many expect. Indeed, if you look today at Italy, about which we're hearing so much, that country will be the third most powerful member of the European Council. Other states, which have been recipients, will now become contributors, and the EU's political centre of gravity will shift very markedly south. The EU27 will not be the same as the EU28-1, the UK, and that will have huge implications across the field. The United Nations too is changing, more fundamentally than many recognize, through a more assertive General Assembly and recognitions that countries like India, Germany and Japan now have a legitimate claim to greater influence. Even the Commonwealth, whose GDP now rivals the Eurozone, is evolving. It is not the post-imperial club it once was, but is searching for a new role. And that's why when people come to me insistent that we should do more of the same. I disagree. Britain's history should not make us curators of a crumbling international orders. Instead, it should place us like our predecessors at the creation of a new one. That asks an urgent question of British foreign policy. How can we help design what is so badly needed, an international system for today's world? First, it means remembering who we are. In an uncertain world, we need to remember that the rock breaching the choppy waters is the state. At the end of the Cold War, there are some who said that the nation state would soon be consigned to the dustbin of history. You can call this the Davos view, if you like, that ever greater economic interconnectedness would melt borders away and make old national frontiers disappear. You might assume that someone like me, of British, French, Irish, and Austrian descent, would sign up eagerly to that view. But while I am proud of my ancestry, I know who I am. I could ever, only ever serve one country, the one I served on operations around the world, this United Kingdom. That's why it's clear to me the Davos view is wrong. The nation state is back, if indeed it ever really went away. We see it in Russia, which is masking a declining population and shrinking share of global GDP with swift and decisive state power. We see it in China, whose Belt and Road Initiative is state-led, designed to advance the interests of the state. In the US too, we have been seeing for years an increasing assertion of American national interest. And even at home, even here, it was the state that we turned to in the financial crisis to bail out the forces of globalization. <coughs> 
Whatever you think of these actions, whatever you think of these players, each of these shows the essential point. The state is back. It is the primary vehicle of global influence and power, and it comes before multilateralism. It's time we acknowledged it. Now, the good news for Britain is that we're starting from a strong position. When it comes to foreign policy, we are one of the heavyweights. Our diplomatic and intelligence networks provide us with a penetrating insight. Our soft power, from our trusted media to our generous aid program, helps us project influence. And our political stability, financial markets, and reputation attract investment and enable trade. And of course, our membership of the many global clubs create alliances that give us reach. Finally, and as a last resort, we can still project power through the convincing threat of force. Insight, influence, trade, alliances, and force. Five assets, if you will, five fingers of a foreign policy. A hand of friendship which can, if necessary, be clenched into a fist. But those five fingers, but if those five fingers are to work effectively together, they need strategic direction. And that, in turn, calls for a revolution at the heart of government. Why? Because that coordination is currently missing. Because the Foreign Office, once one of the four great offices of state, is now a shadow of its former self. Its role directing foreign policy has been gradually hollowed out. It has lost control of essential aspects of overseas influence, like Europe, trade, and development. And it is obliged to take part in a tug of war with the Cabinet Office, which subscribes to a more limited idea of national security. This has created silos in our foreign policy and a culture in which different departments fight each other for resources at home and abroad. The consequence of all this is that successive talented foreign secretaries, including this one, have been hobbled. They've had the title, but they haven't had the power. Now, diplomacy can only go so far with decisions about trade, aid, and defense taken elsewhere. A new strategy matters now more than ever. Because the success or failure of our foreign policy is now more important to the future, health and prosperity of our nation than it has been at any time since the end of the Second World War. That's why we need a foreign office that becomes the strategic engine of our foreign policy again, as it was in 1945, to give it the authority to manipulate those five levers, just as the brain controls the fingers of the hand, to give it strategic oversight of a budget of perhaps even up to 5% of GDP to cover the needs of all the related departments, and let elected ministers make judgments on how to balance our strategic priorities. We need to do something you may not have expected me to hear me say. We need to give Boris Johnson more power. So far, I've talked about the challenges we face and the danger of just carrying on as before. I've made the case for an adjustment in the way we think about the world and the urgent need to give the Foreign Office strategic direction of our country's foreign policy. We need a reordering of priorities, diplomacy, trade, defense, and aid, and we need to coordinate our strengths. Now, there's a lot that I could say about other aspects of our foreign policy, but I want to finish by emphasizing one important theme, the rule of law. This goes right to the heart of who we are, because these islands, by accidents of geography, history, and war, have the long, unbroken tradition of justice. Through that, we have played our part in keeping the flame of liberty alive elsewhere. Now, that is something we can be deeply proud of. Together, with a hard-won reputation in commerce, I think this helps explain why English law and British justice are prized as the gold standard around the world. Now, if you don't believe me, look at China, where the common law is still used in Hong Kong. And if you think that's the last vestige of empire, look at Dubai, where common law courts have opened for any business that wants to use them. Still doubt it? Look at Astana, where the Kazakh president promised two years ago that its financial center would also be governed, governed by English law. And if none of this convinces you, then look at Russia. Vladimir Putin, the man who is doing his utmost to break the international order, is using UK jurisdictions to protect the assets he's stolen from his own people. And then tell me that British laws are not something people value. <laughs>
Now, this is where a coordinated approach under an empowered foreign office could make a huge difference. Imagine, if you will, if we turned this gift to our advantage. Consider how we might use our legal tradition to help other countries that already have strong legal connections to our own. By lending them judges, foreign investors could be reassured that their investments were secure. And our own companies would receive powerful and indeed a competitive advantage. Could we combine this with another strength, perhaps, higher education, by offering scholarships to talented foreign students to study English law here in Britain? Could we devise a joined up strategy that links justice to diplomacy, defense, trade, and aid? Could we use it to encourage anti-corruption efforts, to make trade deals a model of transparency, to link aid, security, and infrastructure projects to a long-term mission to promote the rule of law? Could we be more ambitious still? Could we do more to unite financial markets around the world that already rely on English law and create a true commonwealth of common law? Countries which are at once sovereign but enjoy growing business and investment opportunities could build on that shared legal understanding to make stronger foundations for growth in our world. Now, as I draw to a close, I will just emphasize a few points. I've spoken of the nation state and I've also spoken of that very traditional British strength, the rule of law. I've spoken of the place of our lawyers and diplomats in crafting the international rule of law and our unique offering to the world. But please don't infer that I mean that we should act alone. We should not. I think we should act together, but more imaginatively and creatively than we have in recent years. Because the British national interest is asserted strengthened and amplified by alliances and multilateral organizations, and reviving them is essential both to us and to our world. And in that, we have a crucial, even essential role to play. But multilateralism itself should never be seen as the end. A comforting return to, this, to a reassuring status quo is not possible. For too long, we have used the structures built by our ancestors as shields. The institutions they built were not defensive ramparts. They were forward operating bases, not places to hide, but from which to project ideals, to fight for our values, and to ensure our national interest in security and the rule of law was upheld around the world. By empowering the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and coordinating better across government, we can rediscover our unique role in the world, and we can help write the rules again. Thank you. Tom, thank you uh, very much indeed. We're going to keep standing uh, uh, so that our TV cameras can properly pick up uh, Tom's uh, answers to questions, which will be on the record. There are some roving microphones, I think, uh, with us. But perhaps, Tom, could I? Can I grab some water before we go on? Oh, well, <laughs> thank you very much. That's a very unreasonable request. <laughs> there we go. Go on, Malcolm. Can I uh, just throw in a, a, a first question? I think. Uh, many of us would uh, be very sympathetic to the message that we can't simply wind back the clock, uh, but it's important to create a new and innovative internationalism. But I wonder whether I could just tease you out a little bit more on, on one of your specific proposals about uh, giving the Foreign Office a more central uh, role. Uh, uh, because over the last decade or so, uh, that perception that we need a more joined up approach uh, to policy has been structured more around the idea of a joined up security policy rather than the joined up foreign policy. In a way, the last Labour government, uh, the way it organised itself, did more of the sort of thing you're talking about. But in 2010, we set up a National Security Council. We've had national security strategies rather than foreign policy strategies. Uh, and therefore, naturally, the, the coordinating engine for that has been the Cabinet Office, which, which you alluded to. So to, f to what extent is your suggestion that the Foreign Office should take more of that coordinating role an implicit criticism uh, of uh, the, the focus on building up the National Security Council, <coughs> national security strategies, which we've seen over the last eight years? Or, or are those two themes entirely complementary? Well, look, we've had some extremely impressive national security advisors in this country, starting with Peter Ricketts, now Lord Ricketts. 
who created uh, from nothing uh, an office that now is doing extremely well to coordinate, as you rightly say, security. But this isn't just about security. When we talk about Brexit, for example, we're not just talking about European security. In fact, we're not even just talking about European trade. Mm. We're fundamentally talking about Britain's place in the world. And that's why bringing security together with Europe, together with aid, together with trade, is actually what we're talking about. We're talking about an overall foreign policy. And while the role of the National Security Advisor is essential, and I would agree that it's a very important role that has been carved out, there is more to foreign policy than security, and it must link with the other branches of government. Excellent. Very good indeed. Right. Uh, we have a number of lots of... Uh, usually at Rusi meetings, Tom, it takes a while for people to warm up with questions, but not apparently for this particular occasion. Uh, please, at, at the front here. And would you introduce yourself? Please. Uh, if good questioners could stand up, it would allow everybody to hear a little bit more clearly. James. Um, Tom, thank you very much indeed. Uh, James Landell, BBC. Two quick questions. One is, um, have you had any indication from anybody within government that they like your idea and would like to start thinking about it? Um, and s secondly, uh, a, a broader question. How does your plan for a sort of new British muscular internationalism fit with the, the thesis that says that actually what's happening or what must happen now is that uh, what was seen as a US-based international rules-based order that set up in the Second War should be one that should change and adapt and better reflect con uh, current power structures, i.e. the rise of China and India and other nations like that, and that that's the key question. How does Britain fit into that process? So the, uh, the, the answer to the first question is the joys of chairing uh, a, a select committee in the House of Commons is that you do not answer to government. And so I'm delighted to say that uh, these are my opinions uh, and reflect solely my views. Uh, and, uh, and if they are shared at all in government, I shall look forward to hearing it. But, uh, but I shan't be holding my breath. Um, the, the reality is that the world has changed, as I've described. And you're absolutely right that the US place uh, in the international order uh, since the Second World War has evolved. And one can, you know, one can look at many reasons for that evolution. One can look at uh, the end of the Cold War. One can look at the changing nature of US defense engagements in Western Europe. One can look at many other areas where trade, uh, defense, and aid have evolved separately. And one can see that the United States is simply not in the same place as it was in 1945, or indeed in 1960, or even in 1980. Now, one can complain about it, or one can face the reality full in the face. And this is where, actually, I would start uh, looking at, I don't know how many of you saw uh, Gideon Rackman's piece in the FT yesterday, which was very interesting, which spoke about uh, the idea of countries, he calls them second tier, I certainly wouldn't agree with that uh, nomenclature, but that actually share an awful lot together, the democracies, if you like, that are not the largest powers. And here he talks about Japan, he talks about Germany, France, the United Kingdom, and indeed one can go on, who share a fundamental interest in a values-based system of the rule of law, of free trade, and indeed of alliances that count, that work, and that are dependable. And, you know, that's, that's an evolution, because all of us, for the last 50, 60 years, have in a way plugged into a US system. This would be an evolution to a system that stands alone. Tom, Caroline Flynn McLeod. Um, Tom, uh, picking up a bit on Malcolm's um, point, I wonder whether you're, we've just had a national security strategy that talks about a, a fusion doctrine, which actually we all thought uh, the government departments really were supposed to be fused last time around, all answering to one another. I, I wonder actually whether you're thinking of going even further, that actually we need to have some fundamental machinery of government changes, so that DFID, for example, is brought back into its original home, which is the, the, the Foreign Office, so that there could be much closer working and funding transfers perhaps between the Ministry of Defence doing some of its defence diplomacy, these sorts of things, perhaps even bringing the national security structure into the Foreign Office as well. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Sure. I mean, the primary duty of any government is, of course, the defence of the realm. That's not an original statement, but that's why the National Security Council sits under the Prime Minister in the Cabinet Office, and I totally not only understand that position, I agree with it. But what we're talking about here is bringing together the mechanism for foreign policy, uh, 
And there's a difference between a foreign policy or a strategy for foreign effect overseas and the delivery of technical expertise. Now, it would be absurd to call for the end of a Secretary of State for Defense, for example. And the technical skill required to manage a department of over 200 and nearly 300,000 people running a budget of 40 odd billion pounds with equipment programs into the hundreds of billions running over 40 years. You know, this is not something that we should bring in. But the same is true actually of DFID. DFID is also running projects up to 13, 14 billion pounds over huge numbers of countries over many, many years. And there's a real technical skill there that is one that should have a direct reporting ability to cabinet. But there's a difference between that reporting ability, there's a difference between running the technical skill and having the strategic oversight of its delivery. And that's where I think that the foreign policy, that the foreign office and the foreign secretary has a particular and unique role. So just uh, a supplementary mm. to that, if I may, just to be clear, you're, you're suggesting that DFID would still retain under your proposal a cabinet minister? Yes. If I could right. just come back there, I wasn't at all suggesting get on rid of the uh, Secretary okay. of Defence at all. I was talking about the ability of movement of money, really, that, that DFID into the MOD, yeah. The, well, the, the, the some things that could okay. be movement of DFID back into the Come back to that in another okay. question. Uh, let, let's, uh, Josh, please. Uh, Josh Arnold, Forster, member of the Institute. Um, as ever, interesting speech, Tom. Um, and I admire your defence of the nation state. Uh, it's always perplexed me why so many people in Westminster seem to admire the, the work of Immanuel Kant and think that perpetual peace is, is, is an easy... Is it Immanuel Kant, Malcolm, or is it another German philosopher? I don't know. You're looking. <laughs> anyway, uh, the question I've got, the defence of the nation state, the values that we have, the rule of law, all of those things, absolutely, I think everybody in this room would agree with you. There are, however, people within this, this country who are very powerful, who would see our judges as, uh, what was the quote, enemies of the people. We do see very senior people in Westminster and Whitehall who would say, well, we need to accommodate the Russians. We need to accommodate the Chinese. And there does seem to be, and your, your report, your recent report refers to this, an active effort on the part of our adversaries to, to divide us, whether they've been effective or not, who knows. What do you do about that internal challenge, that internal problem we have in defining what we as a nation want to do? Well, I think, I mean, I think fundamentally you're asking a question of identity. And, and this is where actually the United Kingdom, again, starts from a unique advantage. We have never been a single nation state, of course. We were four nations come together as one country. And in that, we've always been able to accommodate a multiplicity of identities. Indeed, you know, the greatest expression of that, I would argue, is the Good Friday Agreement that allows people to be British or Irish or both all at the same time. Now, that ability to have identity in a mixed way, in a, in a separate way to, say, some countries which have a unipolar uh, identity, a unipolar system, gives you a flexibility that allows you to accommodate much greater uh, amounts of, uh, of understanding around the world. And I think that's one of the reasons why the United Kingdom has always been, first of all, very good at, uh, at diplomacy. Thank you. Uh, Will James, University of Oxford. Uh, you listed influence as an asset, um, which I tend to agree with. Does that have a mean that you disagree with the 2015 SDSR and the latest capability review, which places influence as a strategic end in itself alongside prosperity and security? I'm mindful of what the Ch uh, Chilcott report said about this as well. Well, I, I would argue that the uh, only end is the happiness and prosperity of the British people. That is the aim of every government. Everything else I is merely uh, a, a, an avenue to achieving that. Thank you very much. Um, Can you use the microphone? Thank you. Um, Jung Grant Institute of uh, Statecraft, um, although speaking in a personal capacity, old enough to remember the old Monty Python sketch about the football match between Greek philosophers and German philosophers, which ends in a great big um, argument after a disputed goal. Um, your very perceptive, I th thought very intriguing comment about the uh, Prime Minister, I believe, of a EU founding state, make this comment. The, relation, the difference between the Commission and the member states. 
on the message you're sending, which I think many, many people will agree with, do you see any signs of progress in the challenges being understood in the European Commission in its wider sense, or key member states taking up what you might call the British message? Any signs for optimism, or conversely, no signs? Well, I, I must say I'm, I'm looking at a, a High Commissioner of an EU member state as I answer this, so I must be extremely cautious. Um, but I, I think that um, it's possibly best if I stick to the areas that, I'm, that I know well about, and, and that's when I travel, I speak to individual member states. I don't, as you know, because of the nature of the way the committees are divided, just like government, I don't deal with Brexit, um, which is a great joy in many ways. But, the, but this also means I don't deal much with the Commission. And so when I speak, when I speak to nation states, when I speak to countries uh, around the EU27, I hear very strongly uh, a reflection of the same sort of national identity that you would hear spoken of uh, in any UK establishment. And I certainly hear it when I see sister committees from the EU27 coming to visit us, whether they're from uh, the newer European countries or indeed the older ones. I hear them speaking as clearly about national identity uh, as we do. And that leads me to wonder uh, and to ask severe questions of uh, the European Commission, but those are really questions for Hilary Benn, not for me. Lord Evans. Jonathan Evans, House of Lords. But no microphone. Oh, there it is. Um, I strongly agree with your comments about the importance of the independence and quality of the judiciary and that that's both a, a vital component of our national life but also an international asset. In light of that, uh, do you feel that the current government has given support uh, to the uh, role of the judiciary in the way that it should have done? And secondly, is it viable to offer our judges to foreign jurisdictions given that there is a significant shortfall of judges currently sitting on the High Court? Well, Jonathan, you'll know very well that uh, nobody bows more deeply before judges than I do. And, uh, and, and I, have, uh, I, I, have been, I have been raised at the knee uh, of, uh, of the judiciary for the best part of 40 years. So I'm entirely aware of the importance of uh, properly funding it. In fact, it's a very unusual branch of government, of course, because it is co-equal. Uh, but it's also unusual because it, uh, it's hard for those who are not involved in it to understand that it is the fundam fundamental underpinning of all the rest. And I think that has led uh, to governments over the years, and actually I would argue that you know, Tony Blair's uh, confusion of the role of the Lord Chancellor was a classic example of this, where failing to understand the importance of the position led to a confusion uh, for a number of uh, days, and indeed uh, I would argue in many ways one that hasn't been fully cleared out. Uh, so I would agree with you that uh, we do need to make sure that our own judiciary is properly funded, and that doesn't just mean judges pay, that actually means support and resourcing to the court system as well. Um, but actually, given the strength of the judicial system in the United Kingdom, given the strength of the ideas of the rule of law, and indeed the affection with which it's held uh, by countries around the world, as you know better than anybody, the, the bang for the buck, as it were, that you get, the influence you get uh, for uh, the loan of uh, senior judges around the world, even if they're only visiting to, to lecture, is really quite dramatic. Please. Hi, uh, I'm Shao from Chinese Embassy. Uh, I've got a question concerning you talk about the rule-based system, uh, but when like uh, Iran nuclear deal is broken, uh, what do you think should be the proper response to, to these uh, violations? Well, as you, as you will know, the rules-based system in some ways applies to the Iran deal, and not in every, because of course it was an executive order by the US president and not a treaty under US law and therefore Trump's actions were, constitutionally under the US uh, rules, absolutely uh, valid. And, you know, when you see international uh, agreements like this, it's very important that we remember the ones uh, that are signed and embedded and, 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 and cut in stone, as it were, treaties that are lodged with the United Nations, like the Good Friday Agreement, for example, uh, and see them as different from others, which are agreements between nations. Thank you. Gentlemen here. Yes, uh, Adam Tugio from Indonesia. You mentioned about the, uh, the needs to uh, rebuild equilibriums and uh, new international systems. And uh, you mentioned about some of the countries in the Asia Pacific which 
now has become important players like India, China, and Japan. I would, uh, you know, I, I would like to hear your views how the global Britons or the, Br the British foreign policy on the Asia Pacific. Well, I mean, you, I, I mentioned a few. I could have mentioned Indonesia as well as one of the most populous uh, nations in, in Asia. Uh, but, you know, the, the influence that countries like yours have and indeed that Britain has as part of the five-party defense agreement, but also with our historic legacies uh, in, in places like the Singapore court system, you know, you can see and you can feel an echo that is no longer an echo of colonialism, but actually an echo of partnership. Uh, and that, given the importance of seafaring indeed on Indonesia, uh, would link, I think, very strongly our interests in shining uh, a particular light on uh, the rules-based system through uh, English commercial law that I know many Indonesian companies use today. Uh, Patrick Winter from The Guardian. I was just wondering whether you might be overcomplicating this in the sense that the, the problem is not the Foreign Office has not got a very good set of powers. It just hasn't got a very good Foreign Secretary. <laughs> and secondly, when you were being um, talking about the future of Europe and you said that EU uh, 28 minus 1 would be very different to what we have at present. Are you talking about a, a sort of a more Macronist direction, which is more centralised, or do you see a more decentralised Europe? Because obviously it's huge in terms of how we relate post-Brexit. Well, Patrick, I'll leave you uh, the first one uh, to, to evaluate yourself. The second, however, I will address, which is, um, look, I, I mean, there are, many, there are many questions as to how the EU goes in the next in its next stage. But the idea that 27 countries is the same as, uh, as 28 is, is, I'm afraid, simply not true. I mean, the treaties that were struck over the last 20, 30 years were struck with the idea that Britain would be an integral member of at least the top three and actually of the top, and, you know, and, and, and in most areas uh, of the whole process. So removing the UK doesn't just sort of unbalance it a little bit. It doesn't sort of just change the emphasis by one. It actually changes the shift by a huge amount because what it does is it moves as I said it moves the center of gravity very very strongly south you know when you've got uh, an Italian government that currently is I mean let's be honest is struggling uh, to find an identity uh, within the eurozone within the European Union then we've got uh, we've got a challenge within the European 27 that is not the same as Brexit in fact it's unrelated to Brexit but when you look at all the other shifts that are going to happen because of this. When you look at the movement, for example, of nations from being beneficiaries to being contributors, you start to see that the removal of the UK isn't a shift of one click, but it's a shift of five or maybe even ten clicks, depending on how uh, you do the maths. And so we're, we're looking to approach a European Union that in the next 20 years is going to look very, very different from the last tw 10 or 20 years. Now, in this context, it's worth asking Who's really looking at this? Who's really thinking about the future of the European Union? What are we really going to see in the next 10 or 15 years? Now, I'd argue the only national leader who's really started doing this is President Macron. Now, you may or may not agree with his ideas, and in fact, there's plenty I don't agree with. And indeed, there's some that I would find very surprising if they were to come about. But that's not the point. The point is that he is actually thinking about it in a way that I'm yet to hear other national leaders really consider. And that is a really important moment, not just for the European Union, which, of course, uh, is going to have to uh, adapt and live with the decisions, but actually for the United Kingdom. Because whether we stayed or whether we left, the European Union is going to still remain a very significant interlocutor for us. And it's one in which we have an absolute interest in its, succe in its success. You know, we do hope for the success of our partners on the other side of the continent, on the other side of the channel. Hi, Tom. Uh, my name is Emilio from Politics Home. Um, you sort of touched on this somewhat, um, but yeah, what you say about the Foreign Office is obviously interesting for how it's going to interact with some of the other departments. Um, and I wanted to ask, I is there any way in your vision that they would be sort of um, somehow subordinate to it? Um, obviously, David Davis probably might be a bit worried about some of your suggestions. So um, on Brexit specifically, would you envisage that Boris Johnson and the Foreign Office would have some sort of say extra say over the Brexit negotiations? Would he maybe be going to Brussels to negotiate or um, in, or even instead of DD, alongside or even instead, um, could he even have some sort of veto maybe over aspects of the negotiations, anything like that? Well, I, I'm, I don't think that David needs to get worried. I mean, after all, the machinery of government doesn't change overnight. In fact, uh, it, it moves at glacial speed <laughs> usually. So, so I think he's probably okay until we leave the European <laughs> Union in, uh, in just under a year's time. Um, 
look, I think, uh, I think the point th that is absolutely essential to note on this is not who is subordinate and who is in charge. That's, if you like, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the surface. The, the real question is how do you link the challenges that are facing us? And that's when, you know, when we're negotiating with the European Union, are we really just negotiating about Prosecco and BMWs? Is that actually what we're talking about? Or are we talking about the fundamental position of the United Kingdom in the world? Are we talking about population movements from the south, from beneath the Sahel? Are we talking about our influence in Lebanon and Syria and the stabilization of one of the greatest migration flows uh, of the last 40, 50 years? Are we talking about British engagement in the Middle East, our common interest in peace uh, and indeed energy supplies? Are we talking about trade in South America and defensive agreements with the United States? I'd say we are. We're talking about all of those things. And in talking about all of those things, we need to have an overview that addresses them all. Now, that doesn't mean that David Davis doesn't have a particular technical expertise in the Brexit talks. Of course he does. And by the way, he spent many, many, many years studying this. I mean, if you want to know somebody who's really read the text, it's <laughs> David. You know, so it's absolutely right that he has the technical expertise. And you know, we have a technical expert being the Secretary of State. That's quite right. But that's not to ignore the fact that Brexit sits within a wider foreign policy. It doesn't stand alone. Hi, Tom. Um, Emily Knowles from the Oxford Research Group. I wanted to bring you back to your comments about the UK using its influence abroad to shape the international rules-based order. Um, and I was wondering about your thoughts on this, about how the UK could be a more credible partner abroad in that sense. I'm thinking to the lack of clarity, for example, over the UK legal position over the strike against Riyadh Khan, for example, or contentious support to the UK, uh, to the US, sorry, drones program or the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in, in the Yemen context. Is there anything that you'd change about how the UK articulates or um, follows an international rules-based order in order to improve its influence abroad on that? So you're talking specifically, actually, about uh, the rules of war rather than uh, the international rules-based system. And I know they overlap, but, uh, but you are speaking very specifically about one area. And it's something um, I've written about, and indeed, in keeping with uh, Malcolm's advice that you need a good headline, uh, may I advise you to read uh, The Fog of Law and Clearing the Fog of Law, written for a think tank not very far away from here, Policy Exchange, um, about the use of force uh, on operations. Because you're absolutely right, having clarity on uh, the legal actions that we take as armed forces is extremely important to be able to have credibility in other areas. But I would argue if you look very carefully at uh, our uh, rules of engagement, you would find that uh, British rules of engagement are extremely tight. And indeed, uh, some may argue uh, that the place of the lawyer is, is now that, uh, somewhat senior to that of the commander. And I can see one commander in, sitting in front of me who would certainly have some thoughts about that. Which we may hear in a moment. <laughs> Michael Carlton Smith, old soldier. Uh, very old, as in I asked my first question here 58 years ago. Uh, but um, I'm sorry I wasn't here to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I could ask you about your inspiring concept for the United Kingdom. Is there not a great risk the United Kingdom might become disunited? The problems of the Northern Ireland border, the problems of the strategic ambitions of the Scottish National Party might well be that the fundamental to your whole concept is at risk. Well, I disagree. Uh, I mean, I don't disagree that there is always a danger, but I disagree that it is fundamentally at risk. I think that uh, the great strength of these islands, as I've said, is in our ability to hold mixed identities at the same time. So one can be British and Irish under the Good Friday Agreement. One can recognize the right of a citizen in uh, Antrim, for example, to hold two passports equally, or indeed neither if they choose to. And one can also recognize that in our own system, Scottish law, for example, is equally, is absolutely equal to English law. It's neither above nor below. It is simply equal to English law. And therefore, multiple identities within these islands are still possible, indeed, not only possible, they are the reality for most of us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my, name is, my name is Euripides. I'm the High Commissioner of Cyprus. Thank you for the two tours on. I couldn't agree with you more about a, a more holistic approach to foreign policy because at the end of the day, these are connecting threats and they all come together and there has to be greater cohesion and greater uh, punch as it were. Um, one issue that has not really been studied and I appreciate it very much that you're addressing it is how Brexit affects 
British diplomacy, and you're doing a, a wonderful job in enforcing the debate. Given the fact that it will, the foreign policy and diplomacy, from my perspective, will suffer with Brexit, but the reverse is also true. The EU would also lose from, from Brexit in terms of its own diplomacy and in, in, in the world stage. How do you see that working itself out? Because the United Kingdom will be a third country. Obviously, those that are out will not have the same say and the same rights as those that are in. So how do you see that working out, given the fact that there are very often divergences, given the fact that uh, uh, um, uh, things are not as smooth as we would like them, uh, would like them to be, and, and, and the issue, I repeat, of, of being a third country. The EU will be deciding, and then the United Kingdom will, will just either come along or not come along. And, and that has multiple, triple effects. Thank you. Well, I think, I think High Commissioner, this is one of those areas where I would urge the EU27 to think hard about what they're asking the Commission to deliver. Because the interests of the individual nation states and of the central authority are not always identical, as we know. And by the way, that's true of every organization. I'm not <coughs> singling one out. But here in particular, when you talk about foreign policy, the European 28, or rather the European 26, have formerly had two voices as permanent members of the UN Security Council. They've had France and the United Kingdom. Now they will have one. It'll be France. The EU 26 have formally relied on, realistically, the major diplomatic lifting to be done by two countries, by France and the United Kingdom. That's not true everywhere, of course. In many countries, there are uh, other serious representations. But when you look around the world, when you look at a truly global spread, you're really talking about two European countries. And now there will be one. And so there's a real question that the European 26 have to ask themselves, which is how do they want Britain, which, you know, we're still going to share many of the common interests, many of the same values, many of the same uh, problems, challenges that the EU26 are going to share. How do the EU26 want the UK to interact in that discussion? Now, I don't think that you want us to have a veto over European foreign policy, and I can tell you that we don't want a European veto over British foreign policy. But how do we have a structured dialogue that enables Britain's voice to be part of that so that you have, as a Cypriot, the access to the multiplicity of voices that you want, just as you do now. And indeed, you have a double call, in fact, on Britain's time as a member of the Commonwealth, of course. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it's, great, it's great to have you as both a representative of the 27 and indeed of the, of, of the 52 without the United Kingdom. <laughs> the 50, indeed, yes, of course, they're back, forgive me, yes. Thank you, thank you, High Commissioner. Tom? Uh, gentlemen at the back and then at the front. Tom, Stephen Swinford at The Telegraph. Um, there was some shocking government last week at the EU's intransigence over security cooperation, something which had been assumed to be of mutual benefit. How worried are you now that we're heading towards a no-deal scenario, and do you think we need to be doing more to prepare for that? Well, I'm absolutely convinced that uh, there is a deal possible, and, uh, and I think that what we've got to do is to work towards it. And that's why uh, you know, it's one of the reasons I'm making this speech now, because if we solely focus on the divorce, well, funnily enough, it's going to go the way that divorces go, which is with acrimony and bitterness. I mean, I'm yet to meet uh, friends of mine who've divorced with joy and, uh, and, 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 and speed. But look, that's why we've got to focus more widely, because actually the truth is, no matter how these talks go, the reality is we're going to be living together. You know, we're going to be 20 miles off the coast of France, 30-odd miles off the coast of Belgium and the Netherlands for the next few thousand years. And our common interests are still our common interests. So we've got to focus very strongly on the future world we want to build, on our future relationship, not just with the 27, but with countries around the world, with the Commonwealth, and with many, many others, to make sure that actually the level of engagement that we see around Europe is the kind of relationship that we would want to see from others towards us. And that requires, yeah, it requires a lot of work from us, but it also requires uh, a lot of work from the nation states within the European 27 and indeed uh, the Commission itself. Gentlemen in the front, please. Yes, Raffaele Trombetta, I'm the Italian ambassador. Uh, good morning. Piacere. Uh, piacere. <laughs> um, I very much agree with what uh, the, my colleague uh, Ripide said and also what you say, Tom, about uh, 
uh, the fact that the post-Brexit European Union is not simply 28 plus minus one uh, by something different. And we know that we have got a lot to lose. Fortunately, it was not our decision, as, as, uh, as you know. And one of the paradoxes is that the UK helped a lot to shape you know, the single market. And it seems that the single market is exactly what you don't want now. So, but this is just one of the uh, paradoxes that we have to, we have to face. Um, I'm not surprised about when you say that uh, uh, some uh, uh, leaders from member states are talking about national identity. I don't think the European Union was ever meant to uh, uh, destroy or at least to, to, to make irrelevant uh, national identity. Uh, what we have to um, face as a European Union, uh, even regardless if I saw, uh, of Brexit, this would have happened even with the UK within uh, the European Union, is how we uh, jointly face some of the challenges of the future, immigration, climate change, the, the, the industri uh, new industrial revolution, uh, the international trade, the way it's changing. And when you talk about countries, other countries, you talk about the United States, uh, Russia, India, China, but they are, let's say, more than just a country. They are bigger in terms of size, in terms of also variety of, uh, of uh, culture, of, uh, of people they have in their own. So it's not about national identity, it's about how respecting our various national identity, how we face together the challenges of the future. And so how do you see also the UK without uh, being part of the European Union can, together with us, obviously, face those challenges? Ambassador, it's a, it's a huge pleasure to see you on your place and welcome. I know it's your, you've only just arrived, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to have you in the United Kingdom. Your predecessor was an example to, to the diplomatic call. But the, the, challenge is, the challenge is one that we all face together. You're absolutely right. But it's not one that we face as 28 alone, or indeed you will face as 27 plus one. It, it, the reality is that you know, the Europe's borders don't stop, as you know very well. They do not stop at the Mediterranean. You know, the reality of migration, for example, a challenge that you know, we've, we've, we've seen 50 million people mobile in the Near East, and should we fail uh, in the Sahel region, we're talking more like 500 million people. We're talking a, a massive change, and that's one that would be entirely, uh, <coughs> would have a huge effect on the European Union and a huge effect on Italy, but is not one that's solely within the remits of the European Union's control. It's one that we'd have to be talking to countries like Libya and Tunisia, Algeria and Morocco about, indeed Egypt, if we, were to, if we were to have the effect that we need to have. And I think that's where Britain needs to find her place again, that we're not just part of a single club, we're part of many. And the same is true uh, of Italy, of course, that your, your role on the Mediterranean basin is absolutely essential. But there's also, there's also a, a, an element, if I, if I may, of of looking hard at some of these international organizations. And while I hear what you're saying about uh, national parliaments, and particularly, I mean, I don't need to, I don't need to read La Repubblica just to, to, to hear very clearly that there is a strong national identity in Italy. There are some, and we do hear them, and you know them, uh, who speak very differently about national identity within Europe. And there are some who deny it, and some who see it uh, as an obstacle to greater Union. Now, I would say that is uh, one of the reasons for Brexit, uh, a cause that, as you know, I did not support. But it's, it's, a, you know, it's one of the reasons that I have uh, great sympathy for those who uh, voted to take us out. And one very last question. Sir, I don't. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think one question regarding the. Could you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, Aftab Siddiqui from InnoValue Consult, and I work on the South Asian as a South Asian analyst. The question is regarding the Commonwealth, and uh, you touched upon that. But I think over the last few decades, we could see that Britain generally has been like a part-time lover for the Commonwealth nation, and that sort of you know has been something which sort of you know nation do and now expect that the Prime Minister and the Prince may be able to change that. So what do you think would be the focus in terms of changing that rela relationship and Britain becoming a little bit more active on the Commonwealth front? And secondly, also in terms of, you touched upon the Russian wealth coming into Britain, I would also draw your attention to the South Asian sort of, you know, the politically exposed people. They're bringing a lot of wealth here and every property, every work of art bought in London mm -hmm. is like a less hospital, a less school in the South Asian countries. And that focus is not seems to be there. So would you touch upon those two things, please? Thank Certainly. you.
Well, I think you, I think you've spoken very clearly about the second, and it's one that I don't have. We, we the committee hasn't done an inquiry into, so forgive me. I'm going to I'm going to leave it there rather than wade into territories that I'm not uh, clear on. But on your first question, I think is an entirely uh, valid point. There have been for too long uh, many of us who've, in many ways, forgotten the Commonwealth, and I think that's been a great error. In fact, Her Majesty's one of one of the many gifts that Her Majesty has given our country is reminding us time and time again that her position of head of the Commonwealth counts. Indeed, on my commissioning scroll, it lists her titles and, and, uh, and, and offices, and one of them is, I think it's the third, is head of the Commonwealth. So it's, uh, it, it's something that Her Majesty takes very seriously, and the very fact that uh, the Prince of Wales uh, has uh, taken this on is not, just a, is not actually particularly a credit to the United Kingdom, though we're going to claim it as one. It's really a credit to the royal family, so um, thank you for bringing that up. But now that we are, as you rightly say, re-engaged following a particularly successful Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting uh, only earlier this year, only a month or so ago, what have we got to do? Well, we've got to re-engage it, and that's why I was talking very clearly about common legal traditions. You know, not all of the Commonwealth, let's be clear, not all of the Commonwealth comes from a common law tradition, but much of it does, and there's a lot of work we can do on that. Now, there are already a few lawyers' associations and judges' associations, but that work that we can do together is something that we really must look at. I mean, look, if you look, for example, at property law in this country, much of it comes from the so-called Torrance Treaty of South Australia. Much of it evolves, actually, from Australian law, not from English law. So that interconnectedness is not between a mother country and a daughter country, as it were. We're all co-equal in this evolution of law that we now see. And indeed, if you want, if you want to take, see legal precedent put into action, look at the judgments that are uh, brought into the High Court of England and Wales and look where many of them originate. Quite a lot of the precedents are actually from Commonwealth countries who share similar jurisdictions and who have tried cases uh, before on a similar basis. So I think there's a lot of work we can certainly do on rule of law there. And then there's any number of different areas uh, that we could, we could go in on. And, you know, I've touched on finance very briefly, and we can talk more about education and many, many other areas. I'm afraid, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have run out of time. Before thanking Tom, I would just like to uh, remind members that the next members' event is next week uh, on Wednesday at 1400, and we have the great honour of having the Prime Minister of Norway talking about the security challenges facing uh, Norway and Europe, perhaps at a time when we're about to leave the European Union. A, a reminder that there is a future for a prosperous and internationalist country uh, outside uh, the European Union. And finally, can I really uh, thank Tom most profusely on, on behalf of all of us for that really excellent presentation and that excellent uh, skill in answering so many different questions uh, across so many different areas. This is exactly the sort of event uh, which Rusi loves because it's <laughs> full of content, uh, but it's also delivered by a, a real practitioner who knows his subject area uh, very well, uh, is careful not to answer the questions directly when there is no, uh, no easy answer. <laughs> it's easy to ask questions. It's much more difficult to give. Uh, such excellent uh, and thought-provoking answers. So I think uh, if you've been listening, <laughs> you've come out of this discussion with more questions uh, and a, a rene renewed determination uh, to listen with interest uh, to the Foreign Affairs Committee's deliberations on these issues over the months uh, and years ahead. So uh, please join me in thanking Tom. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,